Hi, I'm the Octopus Lady, you're watching Alien Ocean, and let's talk about pufferfish today, shall we? Or you might know them just as puffers, or blowfish, or blowies? Gross. Or honey toads, or sugar toads, or you know what, we're just gonna call them pufferfish, alright? All right, and to briefly answer the question in the video title, it's probably extremely unlikely that you'd ever be able to build up a tolerance to pufferfish toxin because it's so potent that even trace amounts of it can kill you. But you know, stick around if you wanna learn more about how the poison works. I'm very excited to talk about pufferfish today because they are part of the greatest group of fish to exist in the ocean. They're a member of the order Tetrodontiformes. I briefly mentioned in my seahorses video that I am an absolute sucker for strange looking fish and this order is just chock full of them. You got Monacanthidae, aka the filefish, and I love filefish so much. As far as I'm concerned, they're one of the best fish in the ocean. I mean, just look at that face. How can you hate that face? It is such a face. Oh my god, I love them so much. There is Ostraciidae, or the boxfish, which I don't love as much because I've been bitten by two different kinds of boxfish, and both times they drew blood. So yeah, there's there's some beef there. There's some uh, ground sirloin between us, but I... I, I still love them. I mean, they're literally in the shape of a box. Tell me that box-shaped animals aren't the cutest things in the world. Then there's the best of the best, the kingfishes. No, not the, not the kingfish fishes. I mean the fish who should be kings. I am of course talking about the molidae, aka the molas. No, I'm not kidding. Molas are so wonderful and so perfect. They are one of the greatest things to exist on this planet, and we are not going to be talking about them today, are we? No, no, we're here to talk about Tetrodontidae, aka the pufferfish. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Look, I just love your order so much. You have so many awesome relatives. Why are you getting so upset? You're the first one I'm talking about! There is another group within this order called the Diodontidae, which are the porcupine fish. And yeah, if you're anything like me, you're surprised to hear this because you thought these two were in the same family, and they're not. One reason is because Diodontids have only two teeth in their mouth, while Tetraodontids have four, which is where they get their names. Oh, and also Diodontids are covered in spines, while Tetraodontids are not, but sure, give them names based on the number of teeth they have. I swear humans can be so bad at naming things. And just to get through the usual stuff really quick. Pufferfish live all over the world in salt and freshwater environments, and they've been around for about 95 million years, making them younger than dinoflagellates but older than moray eels. So probably one of the most notable things that pufferfish do is puff. It's where they get their much more descriptive common name, after all. They do this by pumping either water or air into their mouth and filling up their tummy. They don't have ribs and the skin around their stomach is incredibly elastic, which is how they end up looking like this. Or if they're a porcupine fish, how they end up looking like this. The point of puffing is for defense reasons, because it's obviously much harder to swallow something when it's shaped like a balloon. Studies show that in environments where there are tons of puffer fish to be had for a meal, very rarely can you find them in the stomachs of piscivorous predator fish. Some birds like to eat them as well, but they often fail after the puffer fish starts to inflate, unless the bird stabs them with their beak first. Also interesting side note, I thought for the longest time that puffer fish inflated like this, like their whole body expanded around their spine, but according to x-rays on the balloon fish Diodon holocanthus, they likely inflate more like this, which not gonna lie, looks pretty uncomfortable. Pufferfish are also famous for being very poisonous, although not all species are. And I am so excited to talk about this because their toxin is my favorite toxin. And yes, I have a favorite kind of toxin. Tetrodotoxin, often abbreviated as TTX. So named because researchers thought for a long time that this toxin was only found in tetrodontids, aka pufferfish, but it's been found in all sorts of animals, including porcupine fish, some of them have tetrodotoxin too, and also newts, sea stars, flatworms, the blue ring doctor, the eggs of horseshoe crabs, and a couple others. Pufferfish don't create this toxin on their own. Studies show that when you take toxic pufferfish from the wild and feed it food with no tetrodotoxin in it, it loses its toxicity. And on the flip side to that, researchers took pufferfish that were originally non-toxic, fed them food with tetrodotoxin in it, and discovered that it did make them toxic. So all this pretty clearly indicates that the poison in pufferfish comes from without, not from within. One leading theory is that it comes from bacteria that produces tetrodotoxin on its own and gets concentrated in organisms 
organisms as it moves up the food chain. Or in other words, there will be some bacteria chilling out somewhere producing relatively small amounts of tetrodotoxin, but it gets eaten by something, maybe like a snail, and if it's immune to the toxin, it just builds up in the snail's system. And then all these snails that have concentrated amounts of tetrodotoxin get eaten by pufferfish, which concentrates it even further. Pufferfish have also been found to have vibrio bacteria just hanging out inside of them, which is a strain of bacteria that produces the toxin. So another leading theory is that vib <sighs> vibes inside the bodies of puffers and produces toxins that the fish uses. If I had to wager a guess it's six of one half dozen of the other, it's probably a combination of both these things that make puffers toxic. So tetrodotoxin is gnarly stuff. It's 1200 times more potent than cyanide and small amounts of it can kill you dead in like 15 minutes. Tetrodotoxin is not to be messed with. However, human's gonna human and there are some cultures that do mess with it, but we'll get to them in a minute. Tetrodotoxin is a neurotoxin, so it affects your nerves, which in case you didn't know are cells that send signals to each other to inform the body of what is happening and what to do. And nerves are incredibly complicated cells, but to keep things simple for the purposes of this video, nerve cells cannot send messages to each other unless they are able to move around ions, which are positively or negatively charged atoms. When a nerve cell wants to send a message, it needs to let a bunch of positively charged sodium ions in and a bunch of negatively charged potassium ions out. They move these ions through channels, so the sodium ion channel channel and the potassium ion channel. That creates an electrical current that sends messages from nerve to nerve and tells us if we are experiencing pain or if we're seeing the blue of the sky or if our stomach is empty. This is an incredible oversimplification. If you want to learn more, literally type how do nerves work into YouTube and it will pull up tons of videos that will explain it better than me. But the most important thing for you to understand is that our nerve cells need positively charged sodium ions. Sodium kind of gets a bad rap these days and it's somewhat deserved because we put so much of it in our food, but I just want to emphasize that salt is really important and without it, our nerves literally stop working. This is what tetrodotoxin looks like as a molecule. Don't worry, it's okay if chemistry ain't your thing. Again, we're going to keep this simple. All you need to know is that there's this little bit that sticks out from the rest of the molecule. It's called a guanidinium moiety, if you want to sound like a chemistry nerd, which is positively charged, like a sodium ion. And then there's all this other stuff, just a big chunk of oxygens and hydrogens and carbons. So when a nerve is exposed to tetrodotoxin, it kind of acts like a plug. The positively charged bit tries to enter the sodium ion channel of a nerve cell, but it can't. There's all this other stuff attached to it that doesn't fit, and so it effectively blocks sodium ions from entering the cell. The whole nerve completely shuts down and cannot send signals to other nerves. Exposure to tetrodotoxin results in different kinds of reactions, depending on the animal. Obviously, some animals can eat it and be completely fine. Case in point, pufferfish, who not only can eat it without dying, but can build it up in their systems and use it as a defense mechanism, like an absolute bouse. Supposedly, dolphins get high off of chewing on pufferfish, but I couldn't really find a solid source on that besides basically one documentary that showed some dolphins playing with a pufferfish and the narrator was like look they're totally high right now and I'm like are they? Like, yeah, they're acting weird, but how do we know for sure that they're high? We can't ask them. Just because an animal is behaving strangely doesn't automatically mean they're high. Also, tetrodotoxin is totally strong enough to kill dolphins, so maybe they're not high. Maybe they're in the throes of death, you know what I mean? This documentary also said that pufferfish release a neurotoxin when attacked, which I've never heard of pufferfish do, and I can only find one paper that said that they do that, but only when given a mild electric shock, which... I have so many questions about this documentary and none of them get answered. And I'm not saying that dolphins don't get high off of pufferfish, they might. I don't know. I'm just saying that this doesn't feel like solid proof to me, and I definitely couldn't find any scientific studies about dolphins tripping on pufferfish. Humans, however, are absolutely atrocious at handling tetrodotoxin poisoning. And if anyone here is a fan of The Simpsons, you might remember that episode where Homer ate poorly prepared pufferfish and was told that he only had three days to live before his heart exploded, which is not how this works. I love you early The Simpsons, but no. What actually happens is you just become paralyzed and then maybe die. The scary thing about tetrodotoxin is that there's no known antivenom. If you can get to an ER fast enough, they might be able to pump your stomach, but if it's too late for that, all you can really do is ride out the paralysis, and so the doctors will probably need to put you on a ventilator. Fortunately, paralysis lasts only about 6 to 24 hours, so it's not like you're going to be stuck like that forever. That said, there are reports of some people who become fully paralyzed after exposure to tetrodotoxin, but are completely awake and aware of what's happening to them, essentially making them prisoners inside of their own body, which is like horror movie levels of terror 
horrifying to me. Despite all this, though, humans still mess with tetrodotoxin. I'm sure some of you have heard about how they serve pufferfish, aka fugu, in Japan as a delicacy. Highly trained and licensed sushi chefs, because you have to have a license in Japan in order to serve fugu in your restaurant, slice pufferfish meat very thinly and serve it up raw. And apparently, when you eat it, it kind of makes your lips tingle and sort of makes you feel a little drunk. I really want to try fugu one day, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be in the cards, as it can cost hundreds of United States of America dollars just to get a plate of it. <coughs> Patreon link in the description. <coughs> Excuse me. Tetrodotoxin poisoning has also supposedly caused zombies which is a weird sentence to say. I first heard this story back in college. It was like the only interesting thing my molecular biology professor said during the entire class. But he said that witch doctors from Haiti would use some kind of powder that contained tetrodotoxin from pufferfish on victims to make them look like they were dead. And after they were buried, they would be dug up, brought back to life, and then sold into slavery at sugar plantations, which... When I was younger and much more naive, I thought it sounded really cool and plausible, but now, with the passage of time, I think it sounds really dubious. Honestly, this part of the video was only supposed to be a quick overview of the urban legend and a debunking of it, but I actually fell down a pretty significant rabbit hole about Haitian history and culture and the religion practice there called voodoo, not voodoo. And everything that I'm about to say hopefully doesn't sound like I'm passing judgment on voodoo beliefs or practices around zombies. I definitely haven't done enough research to make any comments about that. But I am passing judgment on this guy, Wade Davis, a Harvard professor who wrote a book in 1985 called The Serpent and the Rainbow, where he writes about the research he did in Haiti about zombies and their connections to tetrodotoxin. He says he bought various powders from voodoo practitioners that he claims would make people look like they were dead, but would later be resuscitated, and that the active ingredient in them was tetrodotoxin from pufferfish. After his findings were published, a lot of scientists stepped up and were like, this guy is either intentionally lying or very bad at doing scientific research. I can't get into all the details here, but as a quick rundown of everything, he got a scientist colleague of his to just rub powder on some rats to see what would happen, but then continuously cited that experiment as if it was a real study. He covered up research that did not back up his assertions. When actual analysis was done on the powders, they had next to no tetrodotoxin in it, and brace yourselves, things are about to escalate quickly. He paid someone to dig up the remains of a recently buried child. <sighs> I tried to read The Serpent and the Rainbow for this video, but I only got about 75 pages in because it's not a scientific or academic source. It's just this guy's stories, and pretty sensationalized and exoticized stories if you ask me. From what I read of it, it felt like Davis was painting Vodou as spooky and mysterious, and it's a religion. Like, it's an actual real religion, my guy. One that's faced a lot of demonization, and he profited off of it. He supposedly made millions of dollars off of his book. It got turned into a movie by Wes Craven, and I sincerely doubt that any of the cash he made actually went back to Haiti in any meaningful way, and... <sighs> We got off track. Point is, if anyone ever tells you that pufferfish poison is used in Haiti to create zombies, please inform them that the professor who did this research was an absolute hack. That's a bit of a bummer to end the video on. So here, have a cute, doofy, smiley porcupine fish. And I'll just wrap this up by saying that tetrodotoxin is a very complicated and very interesting chemical compound. And it amuses me to no end that an animal that looks like this could, in theory, kill me. Thanks for watching another episode of Alien Ocean. Today's hopefully interesting question to the audience so they leave comments and boost engagement is, would you eat fugu if given the opportunity? Like if someone offered you up a plate of it, would you immediately dive in? Would you maybe just take a bite or two? Or would you completely turn it down? Leave a comment down in the comments with your answer. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Check out my Patreon where you can get early access to videos and your name in the credits and smash that like button. One like gives you one goofy, sweet little pufferfish who wants to be your friend. And until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood octopus lady reminding you that you don't need to go into space to find aliens.